This video is about an international campaign for the rights of domestic workers. Although there are as many as 67 million domestic workers around the world, they are largely hidden from the public eye. They cook, they clean, they take care of children, they do laundry, they do shopping, they may care for elderly people in the household. And because domestic workers are hidden in private households, they're uniquely isolated and very vulnerable to all kinds of abuse. This video looks at how domestic workers and their allies have been able to shine a spotlight on abuses and discrimination and work through the International Labor Organization, or ILO, to win a new international treaty to guarantee their rights. Part of what is discussed is how advocates needed to research not only the human rights abuses they wanted to address, but also the change process itself. For example, how are ILO treaties negotiated? How can human rights advocates influence that process? Beginning in 2004, I began a series of fact-finding investigations looking at abuses against domestic workers migrating from countries like Indonesia, Sri Lanka, the Philippines, and Cambodia to wealthier countries such as Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, Lebanon, Singapore, and Malaysia. Over a decade, I interviewed hundreds of domestic workers, published several reports, and coordinated with migrants and workers groups to push for national and global changes. In the Philippines, they promised that I have day off, but now in, I'm here, they don't let me have day off. I cannot sleep. They don't let me have a rest. Yeah, have a food. But how to work without the strength? The most common complaints were long working hours, low and unpaid wages, lack of rest, and not being allowed out of the workplace. Many said they didn't have proper food or accommodation and were subjected to verbal abuse. In a smaller but significant number of cases, domestic workers faced horrific physical or sexual abuse or were in situations amounting to forced labor or slavery. This is what human rights organizations say is taking place unchecked in a number of Lebanese homes. Abuse and violence against domestic workers. Al Jazeera spoke to a Sri Lankan woman currently living in a shelter. Her story began when her employer found her crying in her room. Her identity is hidden for her own protection. My madam asked me why I was crying. I said I haven't seen my family in two years and I asked you if I can go home to Sri Lanka, but you won't give me an answer. That's when she hit me with a plate and broke my nose. One question that we often hear is, why do these women keep on coming for this type of work? And there's a couple of reasons for that. One is because they have no other options at home. In many cases, they've taken out huge loans just to migrate abroad, and there is such financial pressure to repay those loans. Almost all migrant domestic workers in Asia and the Middle East have their passports taken away from them. If they run away from their employers, they are at risk of being arrested and deported. Often, we think that terrible labor exploitation is happening in direct violation to the law. In the case of domestic work, gaps and discrimination in labor laws often contributed to abusive environments. When we began our research, only 10% of countries gave domestic workers the same labor protections as other workers. Many governments do not recognize domestic workers as workers. They may consider them helpers or outside of formal employment, and so they exempt them from their laws. It is perfectly legal in many places for an employer to ask their domestic worker to labor for 15 to 18 hours a day, seven days a week, with no benefits, and usually at a wage that's a fraction of the prevailing minimum wage. Some people think that domestic work is, you know, no big deal. They don't see that it can be exploitative or abusive. But think about performing those tasks 
hour after hour from 6 o'clock in the morning until 10 o'clock at night, never having a break, never having even 5 or 10 minutes to yourself. In some countries, especially those with long histories of labor movements and women's rights movements, domestic workers have been organizing for decades. For example, domestic workers in Latin America have been a model to those in other regions on creative campaigns and alliances with other workers' groups. Domestic workers in Hong Kong took advantage of meeting in churches and parks on their days off to form trade unions that then fought for a higher minimum wage and changes to immigration rules. These movements have provided inspiration for domestic workers in other countries, even though greater legal and practical barriers have meant movement building has often been slower and incremental. In Singapore, domestic workers who had good employers might get a day off to attend religious services or computer classes and use that space to meet other domestic workers and share information. In the Middle East, domestic workers smuggled in mobile phones and kept in touch through text messages. In the United States, domestic worker activists would visit playgrounds and parks to reach out to nannies. Whether through migrants organizations, child welfare groups, or trade unions, domestic workers in different countries began to organize, often on specific campaigns that would advance their agenda. For example, some groups would use media attention to a case of brutal physical abuse to raise awareness about the broader problem. Others would focus on targeted campaigns to win a minimum wage or a weekly day off. As these movements grew, they began to form national and regional networks and identified the need for global labor standards. In March 2008, domestic worker advocacy groups, migrants groups, and global trade unions campaigned to get domestic work formally on the agenda of the International Labor Organization, or ILO. This led to a decision to negotiate a legally binding treaty called a convention. A convention for domestic workers would be a real breakthrough. For the first time, it would oblige governments to extend basic labor rights to domestic workers. For example, a weekly day off, a minimum wage, and overtime pay. The ILO's decision to consider a treaty on domestic workers was a tremendous opportunity but it also presented a real challenge. Human Rights Watch, as well as many domestic workers, had little experience with the ILO system. Most human rights treaties are negotiated between governments, but ILO treaties are different. They're negotiated between governments, workers, and employers. One of our first tasks was to figure out how this process worked. A year before negotiations began, I went to Geneva to observe ILO negotiations and to talk to ILO delegates about the process. We learned a lot about who we needed to talk to and started to build relationships with influential governments, workers, and employers. We asked a lot of questions about the timetable for the negotiations so we could be sure that we were providing delegates with the right information at the right time. For Human Rights Watch, the negotiations on the convention offered an opportunity to use our 10 years of research and documentation on abuses against domestic workers and to show the scope and severity of the problem. We took summaries of our research to Geneva, where we met with dozens of governments and employers to highlight the problem and the elements that the new convention should cover. Some governments were really receptive. Australia, for example, used our material to brief their own Ministry of Labor staff. Domestic workers themselves were essential to the negotiations on the convention. Many delegations to the negotiations from worker groups were domestic workers themselves who knew what was at stake. They spoke during the negotiations, giving compelling accounts of what they had experienced and what the lives of domestic workers were like. The negotiations lasted for two years. During that time, some governments emerged as champions. Some of them had strong national laws themselves, and others just believed it was the right thing to do.
NGOs worked closely with these governments to share recommendations and wording for various provisions. There were some real challenges along the way. I remember early on, a government representative saying to me, you'll never get your convention. He didn't think that there was enough support for a treaty that would be legally binding. But we and others showed how domestic workers had been systematically left out of labor laws and how existing international law just wasn't enough to protect them. Some delegates didn't think it was possible to monitor working conditions in private homes. So we researched examples of how some countries did it. That was important to be able to say, this isn't impossible. This is how it can be done. On June 16, the members of the International Labor Organization adopted a new convention for domestic workers. For the first time, we now have global standards that recognizes domestic workers are, in fact, entitled to basic labor rights. They have won a remarkable victory. Since the convention's adoption, more than 20 countries have ratified it, and others are in the process of doing so. The process of the negotiations catalyzed the founding of the first International Domestic Workers Union and put domestic work high on the agenda of the global labor movement. The International Domestic Workers Federation is continuing to coordinate among domestic workers groups across regions to mobilize more workers, share good practices, and campaign for these new global standards to impact practice on the ground. Since 2011, substantial legal advances have taken place in at least 30 countries at the national and subnational level. For example, Argentina set maximum working hours of 48 hours per week, a weekly rest period, overtime pay, annual vacation days, sick leave, and maternity protections in March 2013. The Philippines passed a law in January 2013 requiring employment contracts, a higher minimum wage, social security, and public health insurance. Other countries, including Zambia, Kenya, and Tanzania, have adopted measures to increase the minimum wage for domestic workers. These advances would not have happened without activism and pressure by domestic workers themselves, research and exposure about the abuses domestic workers suffered, alliances between domestic workers, human rights groups, and trade unions, and strong champions among some governments. There is still much work to be done to fight for comprehensive legal protections in all countries, and especially the tough work to ensure that these laws are enforced. But already, these new standards are beginning to improve the lives of millions of women and girls around the world. We need to make sure that these workers receive the dignity, the decent treatment, the salaries, and the respect that they deserve.